welcome everybody to yes thank you welcome everybody to the journalism's round table uh we're pleased to be here on the first day of spring what you call it? AM today eastern time uh and it's it, here in dc it's nice outside so it's a it's a, it's a fitting welcome uh the journalism's round table uh i'll explain for newcomers is um, is a uh, monthly gathering of uh, mostly journalists, and uh, we usually bring in a speaker. We started in 1999 with a bunch of friends, journalist friends, who met at a local restaurant here in Washington, and uh, she was leaving for uh, for a, a doctoral program. She said, "Well, keep this going uh, while I'm gone," and we did. And so we've been meeting uh, at a restaurant here in Washington D.C uh since 1999 and we did that until the pandemic started in, in 2020 and then we switched to zoom which has um uh allowed us to exponentially increase the number of participants uh because we don't have to we're not limited to those who can be uh, at our table in washington dc so we we have we've had people from around the world and around the country so uh we're glad for that uh, when we when we do return uh, uh, in a few months, perhaps uh, we will be trying to we will integrate. We'll have a hybrid so we can meet in person and also be on the Zoom, so that we don't lose uh, lose folks that we've grown accustomed to. So, uh, with that that being said, welcome. And um, I want to start off um, with a moment of silence uh, uh, for. Uh, one of our younger colleagues who was uh, shot by a stray bullet uh, yesterday in Norf Norfolk, Virginia. She was very promising and, and all the people who, um, uh, who knew her and those who did, did know her are, are, um, are saddened by this, uh, this sudden loss. So uh, her name is uh, Sierra Jenkins and uh, we wanna have a moment of silence to remember her and also all the other victims of gun violence uh, uh, both here and at, around the world. Uh, so let's let's just uh, take a moment. All right, thank you very much. You know, the uh, the, the opponents of gun violence have often spoken about how uh, no matter how bad things get, uh, uh, the problem, uh, they are hoping that the media will find new ways uh, to write about this and to uh, uh, and to make the public more aware of the need to do something about this. So let that be part of her legacy. All right. Um, now, I wonder if Paul Berry is here. There he is. Okay. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, our moment of silence, we also lost for, uh, for Sierra. Uh, we also lost some other folks uh, who have served uh, our profession and, and our nation and our world as well. And one of them was Rene Poussant, who is a uh, 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 an anchor here in Washington, but also worked for CBS News and ABC News, and they're having we're having services for her um, uh, on Tuesday here in Washington, and we have with us to say a few words about Renee, uh, her longtime co-anchor here on Channel, on Channel Seven in Washington, Paul Berry. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Paul and uh, uh, have him say a few words. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Is it okay? Am I, I can on? hear you. Okay, great. This tech, te this technology didn't exist when I was on television back in the dark ages. So I'm learning how to operate all of this, and and I'm quite surprised by it because it'd be be wonderful to have have whatever 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 we're using now. Uh, back then, when I was doing news, I could have done it from my home. But who knew? At any rate, uh, I'm. <laughs> Uh, Renee uh, was both inspirational and a great example, and I'll get back to that. But to this group, I don't have to tell you about Renee that you don't already know. She was a first 
uh, in many ways, a broadcaster, level education, talent, and intellect. She actually saw you coming before you got there, and that made her very exceptional. She was wonderful to work with. In the broadcasting industry, I adored her, her spirit, and her unbridled love for humanity. Uh, uh, she was a friend aside from a colleague. She was there for my wedding. She uh, was there, as some of you may have seen, when I had my first child uh, 34 years ago. Uh, she announced it on Channel 7 uh, at 11 o'clock news and didn't know where to go with it. It was wonderful. I have a copy of that, of course, and it uh, reminds me of not only that time, but how long ago it was. Um, and she was a friend. She knew how to be a good friend. Um, she, uh, she hung around with, with us for our kids and when they needed some inspiration, she was always available, but she was also a very, very private person. If you didn't know her and if you didn't, uh, if you weren't someone who came around all the time and saw her, you weren't likely to get invited. She just, she appreciated being public when she was big when she was uh, on television and being private most of the, of the uh, time. Her husband, uh, Henry, a uh, professor uh, at uh, Temple University, um, uh, is very, uh, obviously very saddened. And I've been in con 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 contact uh, conversation with him. Uh, her funeral will be uh, Tuesday uh, at a uh, church in Washington. I presume most of you all know that already. Um, despite her, all of her exceptional uh, gifts, Renee was uh, was was limited, as so many of us are, by our birthright as a black woman. Uh, imagine Renee uh, as a man with all of her wonderful gifts. If she were competing on a level playing field, I hope that, uh, and I hope that she's found such a place. Uh, there's no 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 limits to what she was able to do. But that's not the case for her or for any of us in this dimension. We must strive for it and believe it can be attained. I hope that it will be obtained. I, I adored her, loved her, and I'm going to miss her. And I think uh, if you have not uh, had a chance to read her bio, please do. It's very impressive from her training in, in Paris, uh, her family, the background of her family. And she used to ask about, you know, a black name, uh, Poussin. I said, hey, you know, take what you can, do what you can, use what you can. And she said it was very, it's, it's very interesting to hear her explain her background. So I appreciate having a chance to just stop you for just a second to make you remember Renee Poussin and all the goodness that she did in our nation's capital. She was a, a, a real dear friend to work with, learned much from her. And, uh, and 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 we'll miss her, miss her great. I'm very surprised that she she left us so soon. If you don't know, she she suffered from um, lung cancer, but you'd never hear it from her directly. Uh, she just didn't spend time talking about those things. She refused to have any children, um, not because she couldn't, have, but because she didn't believe that uh, this worth this world was worth bringing children into, based on the way it was until it until it changed. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. life or lack of it caught up with, with her before she decided to have any children. But I would have loved to have seen that as well. So uh, thank you for, for re remembering her. Um, and by the oh, way- I also can't forget that after she left uh, her anchor job, she and Camille Cosby uh, uh, started this project in which they, would, they were recording the memories yeah. of our African-American elders and yeah. had, had amassed quite a collection. Uh, so uh, we want to remember her for that too. She was, she she wanted us to you know, remember our heroes and and heroes, and she helped in that. And she also did some documentaries as well. One Good of point. Two two, that all of that's there. Yeah, and, and it's all available to you. All you have to do is, I mean, if you're interested, you can go and look. I think you you you'll be pleasantly um, uh, entertained and educated by Renee um, because she had that capability. But thank you for the opportunity to talk to all of you. God bless you. I stay away from, since my stroke about three years ago, uh, I'm not as glib as I thought I was. Uh, and so I, have to, I, 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 I don't find words coming as easily as they did. I just sort of celebrated my 70th birthday, although I probably look more like mm, 45 or 50, <laughs> at least. That's what nice. I tell myself. <laughs> God bless you all. Good talk.
Richard, if I could say uh, yes, a couple of words. Um, uh, my first job out of grad school was at Channel 7 with Renee as the anchor with David Schumacher and also with Paul Barry. And Paul's being modest. He and Renee put up with a lot of crap from the from then owners of Channel 7. Um, there was a, almost a type of apartheid that was going on at that station then. Wow. And we had like a bunker mentality to link arms, hold ourselves up. And that was at every level from the anchors to the desk assistants trying to survive in that environment. Even though we were working in Washington, DC, you would know that we were working in a majority black city from the way that the management would treat us sometimes. Uh, we got a lot of support and guidance from Paul and Renee and they uh, conducted themselves with a lot of class and showing and grace to show us how to navigate those, those troubled waters. Oh, thank you very much for saying that. Yeah, she was so that, much above that. At that I just, time, Channel 7 was owned right. by Joe All Britain. Is that the case? Yeah. He had the same right. attitude at the Washington Star, which he also owned. It was, uh, it was, sympt it was symptomatic of apartheid. It was definitely a racist operation. Oh, her, his son, who now runs, or did run, I don't know who, who uh, he, they sent sold the station. When I went to, to um, uh, Joe Britain to complain about some of the things that were going on, or at least to discuss with him, he said to me as I was saying, you know, he said, you you, uh, you, uh, you, you make more money than my son. He said to me in, in a meeting in his house, you make more money than my son, Paul. I said, well, I bring in more money than your son, sir. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, which of course was true. <laughs> Funny man, funny man. But anyway, you know, uh, he died uh, several years ago, and I guess the son is is is. I don't know what the boy is doing, what he's doing now, um, but since they sold the station. But you're right. But Renee was above all of that. That's why I could spend a lot of time telling you about what it was like inside. But what you saw outside was what she projected, and it's what she wanted us to remember her by. So I, I didn't didn't. Didn't go, go into all those points, but thank you for bringing that up. It was not an easy place to work. Yeah. Well, I, I forgot to mention earlier that, uh, you know, of course, we're here to network as well as to learn. And one of the, on the in this format, the best place to network is in the chat room. So please make a, a liberal use of the chat room to talk to somebody individually or to communicate something to the whole group. You can put links in there. and. And, uh, and share other information that we may not have time for in this, um, uh, on the Zoom. Uh, now I wanted to, uh, to talk to, I see Katia Sid is here. Katia uh, is the program director of WPFW, the, the uh, Jazz and Justice Station Pacifica here in Washington, DC. And the news director at that station was Askia Muhammad, who passed away a couple of weeks ago also wrote a column for the Washington Informer and The Final Call, and had a jazz show on uh, on Tuesdays on WPFW. Uh, Katia is planning a 24-hour tribute to Askia on, um, on his birthday, which is March 28th. So look for more information on that. And I want to ask Katia now to say a few words about Askia. Thank you, Richard, and, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Um, I wish Askia were here with us. Honestly, he was an, an amazing um, photojournalist, poet, radio and television commentator, and, and a columnist. But most importantly for me, he was my friend for um, 30 plus years. Friend, mentor, really the last 15, brother, working with him um, as news director, me program director and um, very unassuming. You know, he, he was so accomplished, but you would never know it. It sounds kind of like Renee, you know, very humble. You would never know all that he had done in the world because he was just regular. He was regular folk and he was that way in every situation. So whether he was at the White House, <clears throat> which he covered from very early on, starting in 67, um, <clears throat> he was a White House correspondent, whether he was on the Hill, whether he was in this forum or, at a, a dinner party, it didn't matter. He was the same as Skia and he was welcoming, he was open, he was brilliant. 
he many times he would anchor uh, WPFW Pacifico. For those of you who don't know, we're part of the Pacifica network and we have national broadcast and he would anchor them <clears throat> and something might go wrong technically or we'd have a gap in, in whatever it was that we were covering, let's say hearings or whatever. Askia could just, his mind, and he knew so much, his mind was so, his knowledge was so vast and he knew so much. He could just go on eloquently about whatever the topic was right off the top of his head, no notes, no script, nothing, and carry it. And it would not only be, you know, some people can be brilliant, but it's always, it feels very scholarly. He's brilliant, but he felt like he made everyone like the smartest person in the room that you understood, you got that information and you wanted to know more the way that he imparted it. So, um, you know, we love him. It, it's still very fresh for us. He uh, passed away about three weeks ago. We are gonna do a, a tribute. We did a, a tribute at Bus Boys and Poets looking more at the cultural side of Askia um, because he was a poet and he loved music and he loved writing. Um, <clears throat> but we're gonna do a 24 hour tribute to him on his birthday starting at midnight on March 28th and going to 11.59 PM. And um, I know that this round table is planning to be a part of that and Richard will have more information. Um, I'd like to close with a poem from his book, The Autobiography of Charles 67X, since many of you might not know his poetry. <clears throat> his show was called Yardbird Suites and he celebrated, uh, it would have been 43 years um, had he lived uh, the, the Tuesday after he passed away actually. So this poem is entitled Yardbird Suites. And of course, those of you who may not know, he was also a member of the Nation of Islam and his faith was very important to him. So uh, what he describes here is what happens at a janaza at a Muslim funeral. Pass out Yardbird Sweeps. Pass out candy at my funeral, a token reminder of sweet memories left by the dearly departed. Play birds, what price love? And talk about 52 different ways the weather can be during crack of dawn Radio Tuesday bus rides. Today is 100% humidity, but only 20% chance of rain. Remember, I love Africa, Songhai, that's why they call me Askia. And you know, I love Muhammad. And tell them I tried to practice the golden rule. And uh, at the end of every program, he would say, don't do anything that you would not have them do to you. That's right. And those, that's, what we, what, that's what we live by. And we'll continue to try to make Askia proud as, as we move forward here at WPFW. Thank you. And of course, after that came the, the theme song, Funny How Time Slips Away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Hinton, that's right. Joe Hinton, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's OK. Joe Hinton, that's right. At the end of yeah. every show. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah, yeah, that's a skill. I, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I will be talking about how the roundtable will be participating in that tribute on March 28th. Uh, now, we, we, we are going to go to Hank Klibanoff, who will be talking about uh, the Georgia Cold Cases Project. Uh, but before we do that, I want to just mention some of the people who can just wave, I guess, who are uh, uh, involved in, in some way in this whole issue of, of uh, civil rights cold cases and Armand Aubrey and what happened to him down in Brunswick, Georgia. So let me just ask him to just, uh, I, I see Michelle Duster, uh, and of course, uh, uh, as a descendant of Ida B. Wells, that was, that was what she's most known for, so crusades against lynching. And um, uh, so I want you to, and, and also her brother, Dan. So would you all just wave, Michelle and Dan? Okay, they're here. Buddy Hughes, I see, who is the managing editor uh, in, the, in the Brewster uh, News, uh, which is where their territory includes, you know, where this all happened with Armand Aubrey. So, it's the Wait, Brunswick News, okay. um, Richard. It's the Brunswick News. What did I say? Oh, Bruce I said, Br 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 thank you. <laughs> My mind is going. All right, thank you. The Brunswick News. And uh, then we have Jill, Jill Nevels Hahn, who is in Savannah. I saw you earlier. Oh, there you are. Yes, yes, yes. Which is just up the uh, coastline from. Uh, from uh, uh, Richard, I've been documenting uh, for the Transformative Justice Coalition. I'm sorry. They've been I've been documenting, photographing for the Justice of the Transformative Justice Coalition. They've been supporting the Aubrey family for the last two years. Very good. Okay, thank you. Now, who did I leave out? I know I left out somebody. Uh, connected with oh, oh, of course, I've Jerry Mitchell. Uh, Jerry, would you wait, please? Jerry is known for his, his work with the Civil Cold Cases. Uh, 
think we lost you there, Richard. So, Richard, we cannot hear you. Stay in the middle. Stay in the middle. I said, I said uh, Jerry is known for his work for with the cold cases, uh, working out of um, Jackson, Mississippi, and now uh, at his new uh, Mississippi Civil Rights uh, Organization. And let's see if I left anyone else out who's involved with all of that. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, I think we're ready to, and of course, we have people who are here from who do investigative journalism, which is um, what, um, what uh, that's all about. And Fergus, Fergus Shield is here from the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And Diana Fuentes is here from uh, IRE, the Investigative Reporters and Editors. Uh, now, I, I say I still have somebody out, so, <laughs> so before I do that. Now, we want to, before I get we want to raise a toast to uh, Tom Clark, who has uh, been a friend of mine now so long. Richard, you're losing the sound. We didn't All hear right. who we're toasting. We didn't hear that piece. Okay. Of All right, John X. Miller, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Mike. All right. Uh, John is leaving uh, Washington. He's been in many cities as it is, and now he's going to be in Dallas uh, in charge of a number of departments at the Dallas Morning News, leaving uh, pretty soon. And we want to toast John and ask him to say a few words. So a toast to John X. Miller. Here, here, John. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, yes, headed to Dallas Morning News as the editor, senior editor for sports uh entertainment and um and business with a focus on uh, dei in the newsroom um leaving the undefeated slash um the anscape um and and you know I, one of the reasons is i really wanted to get back into the newsroom right there's nice. still much work to be done in the newsroom and so i i appreciate all my my former colleagues here like wanda and betty ann and so other faces that i see but I'm still in the game, right? Because it's important that us OGs stay in the game in order to, to kept, keep journalism keep journalism alive. I mean, we're seeing now in the Ukraine how important it is for things that, you know, the current generation might take for granted, like photojournalism, right? You know, it's not video, it's not words, but photojournalism is, is telling a different kinds of story in Ukraine. And so it's important, I think, for us uh, uh, veteran uh, journalists to to stay in the game in order to help, uh, you know, keep journalism uh, vibrant and alive in, in today's newsrooms. And so that's one reason I'm I'm headed to Dallas. Um, I'm actually, the, the, the apartment that's is full of boxes. Uh, John X. Miller. Yes. Uh, well, I think somebody needs to be. The apartment is full of boxes. Uh, we're, we're moving next Saturday and on a plane to Dallas next Sunday. Um, and uh, Allison uh, is right now at a, my wife uh, is right now at a uh, go goodbye party with some of her friends and she's staying with RFA as a senior VP for uh, Core Excellence. And it's she can report for America. Yeah, report for America. So she okay. can work from anywhere remotely. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're headed to a new adventure together as a newlywed couple. And uh, anybody who comes through Dallas uh, and keeps up with the morning news, you know, please hit me up um, because we're I'm there to, to be a disruptor. I'm there to make some change in the newsroom uh, working for Catrice Hardy, one of the new black female editors in America. Uh, and we're going to do we're going to do the thing. All right. Yes, we had oh, Catrice. <laughs> so thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. Richard, can I just say that um, I work with John X at USA Today. He was a deputy managing editor for sports. He was he is a, a an extraordinary editor and journalist, and I, I'm so proud of you, John. And my husband said to tell you hello, and he remembers playing golf in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> yes, all right. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you, Wanda. This, I appreciate it. And this Hi, is the moment, and I just want to agree with everything Wanda said. Hey, Bobby. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. Hi, Thank John. You. This is Beatrice. I live here in Texas, in Dallas. So I look forward to meeting you. Yes, Patrice. Look, uh, you know, soon as we'll be on the ground next Sunday. Uh, All right. So, you know, look, look me up. Um, once I start at the morning news on April 1st. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Never mind that it's April Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Richard, I know this can't go on forever, but it's Rochelle Riley. And I just needed to say something too, because I'm so thrilled that one of our old G's is going back into the newsroom. I see several folks who have gone through the Dallas Morning News, John Yearwood, Vernon Smith. Yeah. Tell you that this is Dallas's gain and journalism's gain. And John X, I'm so, so proud of you. Uh, when I was at the Detroit Free Press with John, my anniversary at the Free Press was 9 11, which is also John's birthday. So since we couldn't celebrate, we go to lunch together. So I'll come to Dallas and have lunch with you, brother. But thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, you Ro. Thank you, Ro. I'll, right. I'll pass that on to Allison as well. John right. X, John X, I love you, brother. I'll see you in Dallas. Yes, sure enough, Fred. Asset to my that great will be great newspaper, thanks to its executive editor. Good choice. Yes, it will be great again. Yes, indeed. Well, all right. All right. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, well, everybody. thank you, thank you all very much. And since Bobby spoke up, I want to thank Bobby again because this this table was her idea. So I'm glad that we were able to follow through. Thanks, Bobby. So now we will go to Hank and his presentation. He's got some other people I, I wanted to introduce. Uh, uh, Newton Collier, is new, yep. And uh, we mentioned it was in connection with Sam and Dave a few minutes ago. And Nicole Miller, I said, Colleen, where are you? I don't see her yet. Okay, well, if we don't see her now, we'll, we'll say hello later. All right, take it away, Hank. Yes, can uh, you share the screen with me? I mean, the uh, hosting, please. Okay, let's see. Let's see. I'll take care of it, Richard. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Benita. Thanks, Benita. <clears throat> okay, it's ready to go. Okay. Make make sure you bring up whatever screen you want to share first. Yes. All right, thank you. That's gonna be it right there. And all right. <laughs> A little local color here from Terry Shaw. Did you see that? The, remember the truck convoy? Uh, who, it was in Canada. Uh, they're now in DC and they're streaming down Connecticut Avenue near where Terry is, which means it's hard for her to hear. <laughs> That's just a little local color. All right. Please okay. go. Please continue. <clears throat> Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Richard, for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you, Bobby, for recommending this. Um, and um, I'm, like I said, I'm glad to have Newt Collier here, who's been my uh, a friend and a, and a guide on one of the cold cases we're going to look at. Uh, I was going to go to uh, a couple of them that preceded the Ahmad Arbery case, because, as you know, Ahmad Arbery is not a cold case. It happened in February of 2020. It was only yesterday. Um, and yet it was remarkable because it was so much in so many ways like the cold cases that uh, many journalists, uh, yourselves, uh, academics have pursued uh, for years, uh, starting and most prominently Jerry Mitchell, who I'm thrilled is here today. Thank you, Jerry, for being part of this. Uh, we have known each other for quite a long time. Um, Jerry almost single-handedly changed the reputation of the worst newspaper in America, <laughs> uh, the, the Jackson Clarion Ledger, which I said, and I said that in the race beat. Um, and it was it was awful, not just because it was so white supremacist. It was just it was just bad journalism all around. Uh, I remember a press secretary when I got to Mississippi bragging that he'd gotten the same press release in the paper five times. You know, so um, so anyway, let's let's cut to the chase here. Um, I'm, if I, I I may go faster than uh, and cut through some of the sound because uh, I'm, I don't want to take up your whole life here, but I, I do want to talk to you about this project. Uh, Emory did not have to Emory University when I came here, uh, and I pitched this idea of teaching students how to examine the history of of. Georgia and by extension the South and by further extension the United States through unpunished racially motivated uh, and unsolved but most of them were solved but unpunished racially motivated murders in, in history uh, could have said no and I was astonished that they said yes I had the help of some terrific people here as I was applying for uh, an endowed chair at Emory 
uh, Rudolph Bird, uh, Natasha Trethaway, and, and others who were very helpful in saying, we need this kind of a course. <clears throat> uh, and I created the course with uh, Professor Brett Gadsden, who was then in the African American Studies Department, later was that and history. Um, and we taught it uh, in a, uh, to great effect, I think, for several years, and then he moved to Northwestern University. Um, we, we, this, uh, I just want to point this, you to this, coldcases.emory.edu. Uh, it is our website. I'm embarrassed. It's woefully out of date. Uh, I'm sort of a one-person operation trying to keep it alive, and uh, I'm, I keep hoping that this will be the summer I can I can do it, but we'll see. Um, we use as our textbook records. I don't hand out a book to anybody. I don't even hand out my own book. I don't hand out any books. Uh, we use the records, either FBI. We use a lot of NAACP records. Uh, it You know, students will see things in this class they don't see in any other class. Uh, those of you who have been journalists, you you know what you're looking at. And, um, you know, we work through redactions. I do want to say some a lot of this is going to change. I don't know if we'll have time to go into it. But as you may know, co uh, Congress basically passed a bill to surpass FOIA as regards civil rights cold cases. Uh, they passed a bill, um, a records uh, bill that uh, puts together a five member board, uh, uh, four of whom have been named, and I'm pleased to say I'm one of them, whose charge will be to go through the, we have no idea, hundreds of thousands of pages or whatever of records held by the federal government on these civil rights cases, and to release them, uh, that with, and to approach them with a predisposition to release them, and to uh, overcome the years of difficulty that people like Jerry and I and many of you and others have had trying to get the records out of the federal government uh, and in as pure a form and as unredacted a form as possible. So we'll, I hope that we'll be able to go into that later. Um, this is just a, one case uh, that, that I'm looking at. It'll be actually the next season of the podcast. Um, sorry, right there, that um, just the records of one, one uh, trial uh, that took place, federal trial. We, um, whoops, sorry, guys. I, I want to be clear, this is not a who done it because we know who did it. We're not trying to just solve these crimes. We're trying to put them in historical context. And, and to look at the, at the pattern of that, that has followed each and every one of these cases, for example, the self-defense alibi that was just slam dunk reliable in the South, and frankly, often still has been in more recent years uh, in these civil rights cold cases in which white people killed black people and particularly what white law enforcement killed black people. Um, I want to talk to you about a case that we looked at from 1948. We will get to Ahmaud Arbery, but I want to tell you about Isaiah Nixon, who was killed in 1948 because he voted. It was only the second time in Georgia history that Blacks could vote outside of Reconstruction, uh, could vote in the Democratic Party primary, and the man on the right was responsible in large part for that, uh, for getting people to Black to vote, Black people to vote in Montgomery County, Georgia. Um, and we go into the history of this in the podcast that spun off from this cold cases class. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I will tell you that um, I'm going to play you some clips from the podcast, uh, Barry Truths, which spun off from it. Uh, 1946, you may know, uh, you may know the history that Georgia, like many states in the South, was uh, under the sway of a bombastic uh, white supremacist. Uh, this case, Gene Talmadge, he ran for governor in 46, fourth time for a fourth term, not consecutive. Uh, he was elected and through providential intervention, uh, he died before he could take office. Uh, we actually in the podcast do a, I, th I think a pretty funny little uh, bonus episode on the three governors controversy in which three different men claimed to be the governor of Georgia at the same time before they could have an election in 1948. Um, 
when I went to apply for through Freedom for Information Act for records about Isaiah Nixon, they said, we have none. I said, I know you do. He, he was killed in 1948 in the aftermath of the you know, three governors controversy. The state was swarming with FBI agents. It's impossible you don't have records. And they said, we don't. So then I appealed to the National Archives and they said, okay, right away, we, well, ultimately they found like 235 pages. And I said, well, where'd you get these? They said, well, from the FBI. And I said, oh, uh, how does that? Now, I will say, giving the FBI more benefit, more of a benefit of the doubt than maybe I should. At some point, they shipped a lot of records to the National Archives and just didn't keep good records of what was there. I, I have trouble believing that in the year 2015, there are too many people in the FBI office trying to protect the FBI's activities in 1946, 48, and so forth. Um, as um, in the aftermath, let me tell you what happened of, uh, whoops, that was not good. Can you see the whole thing? Because uh, I have a little strip across the top that's blocking some of this. Yes, I can see the whole yeah, thing. I can see okay. The, I can see the whole thing. Okay. This is, as many of you will recognize, a, a, a tear sheet from the Pittsburgh Courier. Um, after uh, what happened in 1948 was Isaiah Nixon was among a handful of blacks who voted. And at the end of the day, two white men showed up at the farm that he and his mother owned 59 acres where he and his wife lived with his mother and with his, their six children. And, um, he was uh, inside the farmhouse and two white men showed up, two white men he'd grown up with. And those of you who, know the South, know the Gothic nature of the South, may not be surprised to know that these two white men who had come to either muscle uh, Isaiah Nixon or kill him, had known him growing up. As Mrs., uh, as Isaiah Nixon's mother said, they had lunch in our house, in our farmhouse. That's, how, how can they come kill him? But they did, they asked him if he voted. He said, I reckon I did. They said, who'd you vote for? And it wasn't for Talmadge, Herman Talmadge, in this case, running for his, the seat his daddy was not able to take when he died. And uh, he and Isaiah Nixon uh, was shot three times by the two white men when he wouldn't go with them for a ride. He may have heard that earlier in the day, the same family of white men had beaten up Dover Carter, the NAACP had beaten him up, left him on the side of the road, bloodied. His sons, then seven and I think 10, saw him, brought him home. And Dover Carter, who we'll come to in a second, had made the decision that he was leaving Georgia. He was going to, and his, he had some good farmland. His wife came from the wealthiest Black family in the county, and he put all 10 kids on the train. Silver Meteor in Atlanta and took him to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And frankly, they never left and they're still there. Now, of course, Dover and his wife are no longer alive, but the Pittsburgh Courier adopted this as a mission to write about the, the, the family so much so uh, they, they had so many stories and they raised a lot of money. And this is one of the highlights, I think, of the podcast is how they raised enough money that they were able to build uh, the the uh, Nixon's a home not there in uh, Dawson, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, Austin, Georgia, but in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm gonna... This is the family taken by A.M. Rivera. Many of you may have known him um, at, at North Carolina Central University, but he also freelanced for the Pittsburgh Courier. Um, this is Isaiah Nixon's mother. This is his wife holding their 13-day-old son. This is right after he's shot, and Isaiah is shot and killed. Uh, and this is the person who is the primary voice in the podcast, Dorothy Nixon Williams, and she's phenomenal. She was so amazing on the podcast without ever trying to be that when she walked out on stage, uh, here in Atlanta in a room of 400 people who knew nothing about her but what they had heard on their earphones. She got a standing ovation that was so powerful. She and I were crying and we had trouble proceeding with an interview after that. But Dorothy Nixon Williams, six years old here, and all of them witnessed their father get shot and killed on that day. Um, 
I do want to say this photograph, Mrs. Uh, Isaiah Nixon's widow, Sally here, lived long enough for me to give her a gift of it framed after I finally found it. Uh, she was at 90, I think five or 96 years old. Uh, our research is very dangerous. And the reason I say that is that if you look at the uh, ladder here, <laughs> uh, you will see that it's about to topple over. And I'm yelling to the student, Lucy, get down. I cannot have one of my students falling and cracking their head on a filing cabinet in rural Georgia. It just doesn't go over well. Uh, we were looking for records related to the uh, killing of uh, Isaiah Nixon. Sure enough, this student who happened to be a water polo star, she's like spider woman. She got up there. She didn't come down. She got up there and found in that box, found records, indictments of the two men who killed Isaiah Nixon. It didn't matter. There was a 15 minute trial that or hard. It was almost as if it were 15. It wasn't much. And the two men were acquitted. Um, but we went down there. Now, let me tell you what happened after Isaiah Nixon was killed. His family buried him. They buried him at Old Salem Cemetery, a remote uh, cemetery, black cemetery in, in the woods, uh, the clearing in the woods at the end of 14 miles out of the town and at the end of three miles of, of a dirt road. They, and when they went and when they, they left town, go to Jacksonville to live, and when they finally felt it was safe to come back, they could not find his gravesite anywhere here. They looked and they came back every year to help clean that, that cemetery and they could not find his gravesite. Someone finally put up a marker here just in honor of him, a wonderfully decent thing to do. People related to the Northeastern Law, uh, Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, um, but no one had been able to find it. My students uh, locate Dorothy Nixon, then in her mid seventies, bring her up to Emory, we uh, bought her tickets for her and her daughter, who was then and still is a D1 basketball coach, and brought her to Emory. And afterwards, my, three of my students came up to me and said, we're going down to Montgomery County. I said, well, we'll plan a trip. We always do. And I said, no, we're going Friday. And this is a Wednesday. And I said, okay, I'll buy the gas. And we go down there and we go to the cemetery. And I am telling you, within three minutes, you hear, and I happen to have my iPhone on. I had no idea I would ever do a podcast, a document. This is back in 2015, long before I was going to do anything like that. And you hear one of my, I have my iPhone on, and you hear one of my students say, I found it. And sure enough, she had found Isaiah Nixon's gravesite. And I'm going to explain what happened. He was buried here, and never was there any marking on this. The only thing, only marking was up here, it said father. And this slab in the years before it, the, the family came back had sunk and was overgrown with weeds, mud, uh, limbs from the gnarly old tree overhead. And as she stood here looking at this, thinking that is there, there's gotta be something there. She looks down and she sees an I and an S vaguely under dirt and it, uh, like a pounding rain had cleared or something. And pretty soon she's on her hands and knees and we're all out there cleaning all of this. Uh, and I had bottles of water we cleaned it with. And this is what we found. And we called Dorothy Nixon and told her, of course, that was a very tearful conversation to say after 67 years, her father's gravesite had been discovered. And she came up there um, in the next uh, two months after that, it was in the Christmas season, uh, and saw her father's name for the first time. I, I don't have time to have you hear her, this little talk that she gave afterwards. It was mostly complimentary of my students, but it was a phenomenal moment uh, for her and for her, her children and her husband. Um, that in turn led to this man, Keith Johnson, reading the story of how my students had found the gravesite. And he had long, for three or four years, had been trying 
to do something very important, and that is to apologize to the Nixon family for what his uncles had done. The two men who okay. killed him. When Keith Johnson Sorry. Here we go. Arrives. He's understandably nervous. Right, Did you, you hear that? Sure. <laughs> So nice to meet you. Thank, you, look like you were thanks, a thank, you. thanks for meeting me. I really appreciate it. Could you hear that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. And he uh, he went on. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. But he did apologize on behalf of his whole family for what his uncles had done uh, back in 1948, and he did also apologize to. Isaiah Nixon's widow before she passed. Uh, that became the first season of the podcast, Buried Truths. Um, I told you about Dover Carter. I'm going to, his family um, has uh, family reunions in Georgia or various parts of the country every year. And they've been kind to invite me to several in recent years. Um, Here's his son, Aaron, who was um, seven years old when his father, when he came across his father brutally beaten. Okay, now I wanna play you a little something here. A few minutes later, we arrive at Live Oak Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Georgia. It's a sweet country church with a small cemetery behind it. And as we walk to the gravesite of his parents, Dover and Bessie Carter, a chorus of crickets and cicadas greet us. Now, Dover Carter may have fled Alston in fear, but Aaron says his dad always wanted to be buried back in Georgia. He always wanted to be here. He's where he wanted to be. Dover Carter lived to age 81, almost 40 years after that fateful election day. And his wife, Bessie, well, looking at her headstone, I was able to do some fast arithmetic, and I smiled. She was born in the year 1910, and she died in 2009. My goodness, she lived 99 years. But wait, this gets better. I need to tell you that in the time I've spent with the families of Isaiah Nixon and John Harris and Dover Carter, I've noticed many strong and similar threads. They believe deeply in God. Education is the ticket to a worthy and worthwhile life, and nothing should ever keep them from voting on Election Day. It's remarkable to learn that Bessie Carter lived long enough to cast her ballot for a black man for president, Barack Obama. Oh, I think it was one of the proudest minutes of her life. I can imagine now that, you know, looking back when she wasn't allowed to even to vote, uh, but then, then now she's voting for a black man. It was the crowning part, I think, of her, of her life. Barack Obama was inaugurated on January 20th, 2009. Bessie Carter would die five days later. So when the Carters held this family reunion back in Georgia, I was there. As I stood outside the hall where the dinner was about to start, three women approached. They were striding with smiles and joyful spirits in anticipation of the evening's events. They're three of Dover and Bessie Carter's daughters, Mary, Obadiah, and Bessie. And I have just one question for them, standing as we are not that far from where their dad was brutally beaten. Why no anger? There's been no justice, so why no anger? Their parents were believers, says one. They taught us the scriptures, says another, not to keep in our heads, but to keep in our hearts. It's a matter of praying, says a third sister, and leaving it in God's hands. 
My producer asks if there's any kind of poem or a song that captures what they're describing. Obadiah blurts out, yes, and off they went. Look where he brought us from. Look where he brought us from. Well, he brought me out of darkness, walking in the light. You just look where he brought me from. <laughs> A few minutes So that was our first venture, actually, into podcasting. And um, not unlike um, the Civil Rights Code Cases class, again, we're not trying to, um, it's not about who done it. It's about the why and about the context. Um, we sort of I stumbled into a phrase one time when I was in the recording that says when we understand who we were we can better understand who we are and that sort of has been a guiding force ever since um the next one the next case that we looked at was 1962 ac hall macon georgia uh ac was 17 years old and um was um a handsome young man uh he used to play basketball with uh, newt collier who's with us today um and Macon in 1967, uh, 1962, was a pretty popping place. Uh, had a lot of good music going on, as some of you may know. Uh, this is the Middle Georgia Veterans Club, where AC Hall and other teams would go on certain nights. And uh, I'll tell you about this particular night. He goes there to meet a young girlfriend he's swayed on, uh, named uh, Eloise. Excuse me, Eloise Franklin, and. Um, I'm just going to play you a little bit here. Every story has a soundtrack, and we can't really talk about Macon without talking about music. That river I mentioned earlier, the Akmalgi, means bubbling or boiling water. So what was bubbling up out of the river in Macon in 1962? Rhythm and blues, soul music, rock and roll, truly immortal stuff. Otis Redding was raised here. Little Richard was born and raised here. James Brown recorded his first hit, Please, 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 at WIBB, a black format radio station in 1955. Now these three guys aren't just big stars. Rolling Stone magazine included all three of them in the 100 greatest artists of all time. Three guys from Macon. James Brown at number seven, Little Richard at number eight, Otis Redding at number 21. So if you'd been on Cotton Avenue on the night of October 13th, 1962, you'd have heard that music spilling out of the Middle Georgia Veterans Club. Now on different days, this two-story red brick building was host of veterans or scout troops, others. On this night, a Saturday, the club had opened its doors for a teen night, a party at which Macon's black teenagers could drop by, could meet, could be safe. That same year, that same month, October 1962, Otis Redding released his first big hit. These arms of mine They are lonely This song talks of a guy who really wants to be with a certain girl. He's falling for her. He wants her in these arms of mine. It's the perfect background song for a date, a date between A.C. Hall and Eloise Franklin, the two teenagers at the center of our story. I'm wanting you and if you A.C. and Eloise arrived separately at the Veterans Club that Saturday night. A.C. was 17, handsome, athletic, and tonight dressed nicely in a crisp white shirt. Eloise was 16, very pretty and smart, and tonight in her best dress with stockings and black flat shoes. And after a while, they left the club. They stepped out into a surprisingly warm, 
October evening, there on Cotton Avenue, and they walked carefree under an autumn moon. Eloise had her eye on AC. A friend of hers explains why. Her name is Ollie Mae Hutchins. She said that was her first love. Her first love. Whoops. Every story has a soundtrack. Sorry. Can't really talk like about that. Macon without talking about music. I don't know why that music is continuing. That river I mentioned earlier, the Akmalgi, means bubbling sure or boiling water. Music. So what was bubbling up uh, out of the river in Macon in 1962? Hold on one second. Rhythm and blues, soul music, rock and roll, truly immortal stuff. Otis Redding was raised here. Little Richard was born and raised here. James Brown recorded. Give me one second, if you don't mind. Is that all right, Richard? I'm sorry to do that, but That's um, fine. I just need to make sure I don't have that running through there. I think I did something earlier trying to learn how to do that. And guess what? I guess I learned it and didn't know I'd have. Um, we're going to try it again and just see if I can avoid that. Yo, I apologize. No uh, worries. And if it does it, uh, I don't know. I'll figure out something. Let me just. All right. So that has stopped for now because I, okay. Can you hear me? Is everyone okay? Just give me a thumbs up, somebody. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So what happened? What happened that night was they're walking along and they get down to George Washington Carver School, which is where AC had gone to school. And, you know, I'm sure there's a little hugging and stuff going on. And what they don't know is that a white woman has, who lives not terribly far away has called the police to say that she drove up to her mother-in-law's house in her, their, in her truck and saw a, her husband's car in front of her. And she saw a colored man get out of the truck, out of, out of her car. And then when she and her husband went and checked, they saw that her husband's gun was missing from the car. And so the police said, do you think you'd be able to identify that man? She said, yes. And so they said, we'll be right there. And they went and they picked up the couple and they put them in the back of the police car and they're going around looking for a man who's carrying a gun. And they come across AC Hall and Eloise Franklin, the police lights go up on them and AC and the woman says, that's him there. And AC Hall starts to run. Now I'm just gonna stop here and tell you that every bit of investigation we've done and we've done a lot and including involving the current sheriff who's white guy been there for 40 years and there's no possibility that ac hall was the person who stole the gun if a gun was stolen okay there's just no possibility um the as he began running the police began firing their guns they just start shooting and those of you who know the laquan mcdonald story you can, i can tell you it's very similar to that story okay and um, um, the, the, there's a coroner's inquest, and the person dispatched to the coroner's inquest to help the, the A.C. Hall family uh, is this man, Howard Moore Jr., who worked well, an attorney, in, black attorney in Atlanta. And he is one of the young bucks there. The other one's Vernon Jordan. And he sends Howard Moore down to Macon to represent the Hall family at this coroner's inquest. He has no idea what the coroner's inquest is. He's a rookie. He's never been there. So, and this is him, by the way, coming to, when he came to my class, okay? And he's 90, by the way, still living in California. As many of you know, after he made his reputation uh, in, in Georgia, he was hired as chief counsel uh, defending uh, Angela Davis in the Marin County case there. Uh, this happens to be the courtroom where the coroner's inquest was held. 
That balcony, of course, is where the black people sat and where they yelled out at him. He ain't no Donald Hollowell. Who is he? He's not Donald Hollowell. We want Hollowell, but he he did magnificently. They have preserved that uh, balcony, by the way. Um, and in the end, let me just tell you what happened in the coroner's inquest. Here's, here's what one of the policemen said. He said, I was shooting to the left side, just pulling the trigger as fast as I could pull it. It happened so fast that like I was, I was scared when the man turned. I wasn't hardly aiming, just pointing the gun at him and firing. So there, the, the police officer's defense was that A.C. Hall looked like he had a gun. He was going for a gun. The story changed from that, you know, and he had turned and was aiming and was shooting. And the coroner's inquest, five men, white men, all four of them born in the 1890s. Okay, that's how this, this is 1962. They listened to the testimony. Now, let me tell you about the advantage that police officers had in Georgia. It's astonishing. In Georgia, if you were, if you were charged with a crime and you were a police officer, you got to sit in the coroner's inquest and hear all the testimony against you or the grand jury and the grand jury. You got, to, you got to go into the grand jury and hear all the testimony against you. And then having heard all that, you got to give the last statement. And guess what? You could give that statement without being sworn in, which of course means you can just make it up, and without being cross-examined. And that was the law. And that law, by the way, lasted in Georgia until 2016. Okay. Now the coroner's jury, despite that, was so apparently appalled by this testimony from the cops. They kept contradicting themselves and everything that they they went beyond the call of what the coroner's inquest is supposed to do. And they said in, in their final statement, in our opinion, this was murder. Okay. And they didn't believe a word from the police. Then it goes to the grand jury. By that time, the police officers had an opportunity to clean up their their statements to get their stories right, and the grand jury disagreed. They decided that it was self-defense, that they shot in self-defense, even though there was no gun found that night. There was a gun found the next day, and it was a German, a rare German gun that clearly seemed to have, would not have been the gun A.C. Hall did. The, fat, the man whose gun was stolen looked at it and said, that's not my gun. Um, in my class, it uh, the, the, the 56th anniversary happened to fall on a Saturday and I decided to take my students down. And so we went down on uh, uh, Saturday and walked the, the same steps that AC and uh, Eloise Franklin had walked 56 years earlier um, in the daylight. And then we went back at night. Here's Mr. Collier helping me. Uh, this became a podcast as well. Um, and this is our walk at night, right over here where the arrow is, where A.C. Hall ran and fell to the ground after he'd been shot by those officers. Now, I need to tell you one other detail that was very persuasive to the coroner's inquest, the, the coroner's jurors. The medical examiner came in and said that A.C. Hall was shot dead in the back, straight on in the back. He could not have been turning. And he was queasy about saying that. He didn't want to have to say that, but that's what he said, okay? And that's another reason that they felt like they could not you know, reach any conclusion other than he had been murdered. I want to play you uh, a conversation I had with the woman who said that's him there, who identified A.C. Hall. It took us I think I saw from 2015, 2016, it took us four years to reach her, okay? I finally got her on the phone myself. Usually I will have students do that as much as I can. And this is my conversation no, with her. No, that's not a good idea. Like I said, our health is not good. Can you hear that? It's not up to something like that. So neither one of us is interested. We would rather just let it stay back in the city where it was, but. Well, let it stay not. back in the 60s. You know, I actually hear that a lot as I research these civil rights cases. 
Sometimes it's phrased as, hey, that was a long time ago. Why can't we let bygones be bygones? You know, at this point, I'm feeling I've got one more question I can ask before she cuts this off. Yes, it was. It, it had to shake you up a lot, you know. And I know one question my students are asking is when that happened and when you said that's him, did you have any idea that the police would just start shooting? You know? Heaven no. Why would I? I mean, you know, I, I had no idea whatsoever. So, but uh, like I said, that was a long time ago, and I just rather not discuss it. So, as this conversation comes to an end, she added this: "I don't want to talk about it because honestly, I don't want to talk about it. I don't think I should have to. It's been closed out and settled, and right. I don't see the point of bringing it up again." Right. Okay. You know, I have to tell you, there's a part of me that really does want to let this thing go to just leave it right there. But then I think about A.C. Hall's mother, Curly Hall, and his grandmother, who died brokenhearted, and his girlfriend, Eloise Franklin, who lost her first love. For them, and for A.C. Hall's childhood friends, people like Newt Collier, who A.C. could outdunk, and Vivian Butts, who always felt A.C. was looking out for her, and for the church members, like Pauline Thomas, who found A.C. to be a respectful, sweet kid. And for Hall's attorney, Howard Moore Jr., who never knew A.C., but was brilliant in giving A.C. a presence in the courtroom. For all of them, this was never closed out and settled. They were never able to let it go. So not to be mean or hurtful to Doris Hopper, but I'm thinking she needs to know this. Well, your, I just, I, that's fine. From your perspective, it's closed out. From the family and the friends of A.C. Hall, it's not over. That's okay. the only thing I would say. That's, still... fine, that's up to them, but from my, from my point of view, mine is that mine done with it. So another person no, that's not a good... that I spoke to, um, he, he, I had called his sister. And that is the son of one of the two police officers, because the policemen are both dead now. And um, I tried to reach a sister. This guy ends up calling me. Uh, and we had what I would think was just an amazing conversation. Um, and by the way, all these recordings, they were, but they both agreed to let me record them, you know, because they thought. He said, I, you can, sure, you can record me. I'm not, I mean, she said, yeah, I'm not going to say anything, but whatever it is, she said. And all the details are all based on things we found in the record. So if you don't mind, this is Mr. Kenny Durden. My dad was a fine, upstanding man, a good, honest man, and he worked every day of his life to support, you know, his family. And I know what kind of man he was, and I just don't believe that. I just don't believe he done anything wrong. I talked with him later in life after I grew up, and I think what he done, he done in the line of duty. I don't think he done anything underhanded. He was protecting his life is what he was doing. As that last statement suggests, the story that Kenny Durden got from his father is roughly the same story you've been hearing from the police and the hoppers, with a few important differences. In Kenny Durden's version, A.C. Hall had a gun, and the shooting took place while Officers Durden and Brown were chasing A.C. on foot. The lady that the gun was stolen from, she identified the guy, and when he ran, they got in a foot pursuit with him, and that's when my dad said that he pulled the gun out, and that's when he was shot. Right. And I really believe what he told me to be the truth, and Nobody will ever make me believe otherwise, and I don't think I'm being biased just because he was my dad. Right. I just know him. But now, there was something I needed to tell Kenny Durden, something he didn't know. Right. And it concerned that report from the medical examiner. It was when the medical examiner came in with his report, and it showed that the young man had been shot right in the back. Yeah. Uh. Then Kenny Durden repeated the version that he'd long believed to be true, the version in which A.C. Hall precipitated the shooting. 
But Durden seemed to be searching for something that could explain how AC came to be shot in the back. Well, my dad said that he was running and that he reached in his back pocket like he was reaching for a gun or like he was turning to shoot or something. And that's when they fired, so I don't know. Let's not gloss over that last remark, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to make too much of this. After all, this is probably the first time Kenny Durden's ever heard a version that countered his dad's account. But he's clearly thinking about this alternative version. And then he says something that makes me wonder if he's wrestling, even struggling with this new information. If the young man lost his life any other way than that, I'm terribly sorry. I mean, I'm sorry the young man died anyway. My dad was a fighter. Um, I do want to play one more clip from that interview because this this project examines tries to examine racially motivated killings. But I don't. I my students and I wrestle. We don't often know the motivation. How much of it was was racial and personal in that sort of way. Uh, and so in this case, because I don't know enough about. Durden or or the other officer Brown, uh, we are reluctant to say this was a racially motivated. But I am prepared to say, and maybe this is just my growing up in the South and seeing it and everything I've know for seventy two years that they that these white police officers were racially conditioned to shoot that black kid when they would not have shot a white person. Yes, and. And I am I so I come up with this racially conditioned as a as an explanation. And um, but I don't want that to be something that anyone would ever use to as exculpatory. Oh, you know, I, I keep thinking of Officer Krupke and West Side Story and these guys saying it's just the way we, we was brung up, you know, I mean, we brung up this way, you know, that is this is not to be exculpatory. And but I Here's why I'm glad I don't. Let me just play this last thing here. Now, we've talked about racial conditioning that Georgians like Brown and Durden and the Hoppers were typically surrounded by and subjected to in their young lives. But we've not had any indication of the racial attitudes of the two officers who shot A.C. Hall. So I asked Durden about his father's views on race. He had black friends that uh, that meant just as much to him as any white friend that he had, but he did have a stigma about black people, and I think it was to do with the way he was raised. He didn't have anything against them, but he didn't want to mix and mingle with them. He, he expected them to stay with their kind, and he stayed more or less with his kind. Stay in their place. So in other that words, talked about racial. Cap Sorry. So in other words, I didn't have to say it. <laughs> uh, last thing from that from AC Hall. Aaron Aquindo had a take that I found so uplifting. Aaron Aquindo. We've been focusing. Had a take that I found so Sorry. uplifting. This is at the gravesite of AC Hall. Weeks on the tragic death of AC Hall, and we'd really come to like this young man. We'd focused on the horrible circumstances that led to his death. This was some really depressing stuff. Some of us were moved to tears as we walked the night before to Ash and First Streets, where he died. And then in the morning, as we stood over his gravesite, how, I wondered, do we go forward from here? How do we clear our eyes and see a path forward? As usual, a student showed the way. I'm going to let student Aaron Okindo deliver the benediction for this season of Barry Truths. Part of me felt weird at first last night when I was at the site of his death on First Street in Ash because I felt like I'm here because he died. But now being at the gravesite, it's like I'm here because he lived. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm, I'm here of, because you live. I had a take that I and found so. That is something that I feel, I feel like it does him a little bit of justice. This is Barry Truce. I'm Hank Libanoff. So am I pushing the limits here or can I keep going a little bit on Arbery, focusing just on two or three small parts? Please do, please do. Oh, thank you. Okay, so like I said, uh, we I was down in South Georgia working on what would have been season three uh, down in terrible Terrell County. Many of you know that historically down in Dawson County, right next to Albany. I mean, Dawson, Georgia and Terrell County, uh, when COVID broke, broke big there, as you know, that was page one um, stories that came out of there because of funerals that people went to and caught COVID. Um, and so I very quickly got out of there and uh, wasn't about to take any students down there. But I did, um, I did decide um, just to cool my heels and try to figure out what would be next. And then the Ahmaud Arbery story breaks, the video comes out, and I had five students who called me, at, at, you know, I mean, well, who had been looking for work. They had lost their internships, their jobs, you know, their, their whatever they were going to do for the summer. And so I called them all and said, you want to work? And they said, yeah. And I raised a little money. Can't ever raise enough, but raised a little bit of money and was able to keep them gainfully employed working on the Ahmad Arbor case. Um, and I, many of you would know so much about the details of the case at this point. I'm not going to go over it all because I don't want to end up and spend all your day. But, um, you know, he is, he's hunted down it, by grown men armed and in, car, and in trucks and trapped and can't get out. And we are very graphic in this one. And we're very unsparing in this particular uh, episode uh, and season of the podcast. Um, these were the students who worked for me. They did a remarkable job of research without even being able to go down there. And they wanted to, and their professor wouldn't let them, okay? Um, and they wanted to even join in on the, on the I Run With Mod, and I, we had some wonderful discussions about the ethics of that. Uh, and in the end, none did that I know of. Uh, you know the men who were, by now you've seen these pictures. Uh, I wanna play a little bit here about um, Ahmad from some of his close friends. Whoops. I don't know if that sound is gonna work here. Sorry, guys. Nope. Um, anyway, he was the prankster, the jokester, the funny guy comes through. And, and if you listen to the podcast, um, the good the good fellow at the same time, you'll see a fellow, who, a guy who was deeply troubled. If you see his uh, hear his uh, episode of his encounter with a police officer when he's just out chilling on a, uh, in a park, um, it's horrifying to listen to that, uh, to see how this police officer clearly had profiled him and was not going to let him go. And uh, it's, it's horrifying, as I say. Uh, one of the things that we looked into that I was very proud of was, I want to know, so where did the McMichaels and Roddy Bryan get their thinking that this property that they lived on was just, was theirs and did, had no other history before it? And that Ahmad Arbery had no basis for thinking that he could be there and could be jogging there. And um, we did some research and looked into the pasts of the McMichaels. And sure enough, I mean, it's not surprising if their family had been there a long time that they were uh, they served in the Confederacy. They were soldiers in the Confederacy. It also maybe isn't a complete surprise but they also were slave owners in, uh, in, in, in the 1800s. Um, does that, I have to say, I do spend a little moment in the episode talking about, does that make them r racist? No, is, is racism uh, uh, congenital? I, I don't think so. Um, but 
whatever it was, it, it, they there is this past and it's worth knowing. What's even probably even more interesting is that Ahmad Arbery descends from the most renowned of all of the enslaved down on the Georgia coast, Balali Muhammad, who was a literate Muslim who came from West Africa, by the way, the Bahamas, then to the US. Um, he could read, he could write, he uh, was brilliant on agronomy, and he worked for as a slave. Uh, he was held by a man named Thomas Spaulding, who was the wealthiest landowner in, in, on Sapelo Island, which is right off the Georgia coast there, and who himself was very progressive on matters of agronomy and said to have been conflicted about holding slaves, but he did nonetheless. And he entrusted virtually everything to Bilali Muhammad, including guns and munition to defend the property if necessary, okay? And Bilali Muhammad went on to um, leave behind when he died of uh, uh, so an Arabic, the 13 page writings in Arabic uh, that are now held at the Georgia, uh, Hargret, University of Georgia Hargret Rare Books Library. Uh, he's that, you know, revered, and um, I just and which oh, puts like sorry, common. which puts into perspective the, the the shock that people like the McMichaels and Mr. Bryan thought this was their land and that no one should intrude upon it. So this is from this is a lawyer down there in St. Simons. I'm going to play a sound clip from. Uh, he uh, wrote a piece for the Bitter Southerner that impressed me and then I talked with him and this is this is what he said so I always felt like St. Simon's and the Golden Isles belonged to the Geechees and so this idea that a descendant of the Geechees couldn't run wherever he wanted to run is such a misinterpretation of place they killed him because they thought he didn't belong there I've studied enough and encountered enough personally and lived here long enough to know that nobody belonged here more than he did. You can't understand or fully appreciate the Golden Isles unless you understand the heritage of the Black people who have lived here since the 1600s. Um, Jerry, by the way, that uh, jo uh, fellow, Mr. Barger, he Barger, uh, got his master's degree at the Mississippi. Uh, at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at Ole Miss. He's now a lawyer down there. Um, Self-defense usually does not apply when the person who is trying to raise self-defense initiated the encounter. You can't pick a fight and kill someone and say, I was in self-defense. There's something else in the letter from DA number two, George Barnhill, that exonerated the three white men. He invokes a Civil War era law in Georgia governing citizens' arrest because, he says, the McMichaels and Roddy Bryan were following a burglary suspect. And he puts that word in quotes. But let's go back to the incident report. You remember the original police report? Did the police say anything about a burglary? No. In the space on the incident report, where the police officer describes offenses reported, Officer Brandeberry wrote criminal trespass, not burglary, as D.A. Barnhill says in his letter. Well, why does that matter? Well, in fact, it could be huge. We turn to Ron Carlson, a constitutional scholar at the University of Georgia School of Law. He's an emeritus professor, and Carlson, tells us why a citizen's arrest offense just doesn't work in the Arbery case. Prosecution's argument against that may well be that a major offense like a felony has to occur in the presence of and in view of the citizens who are trying to make the arrest. Uh, the argument by the prosecution will be that did not happen here. They simply had a suspicion, did the McMichaels, that the jogger may have been involved uh, in a crime. 
And at most, that might have been a misdemeanor trespass, but no major crime committed in the presence of the Michaels will be the argument made by the uh, prosecution in this case. Did you hear Professor Carlson say that the felony has to occur in view of the citizen trying to make the citizen's arrest? Well, what exactly did citizen Greg McMichael see? He saw Ahmaud Arbery running down the road. McMichael told the police that Ahmaud looked like the same man who was videotaped walking around inside the house under construction. So he and Travis grabbed their guns and went after him. So now follow this, because it boils down to this. There was no felony. So no felony, no probable cause to chase Ahmad. And no probable cause to chase Ahmad, then there's no defending this as a citizen's arrest, at least not legitimately. And absent that defense, the McMichaels, well, they become lawless vigilantes with nothing on their side but guns and a pickup truck. So, as you know, if you follow the case, this this is we did this back came out we did this in the summer of 2020 um, and released it this September of 2020. Uh, but you heard a lot of this play out in the trial. So, um, because I'm having some uncertainty about the sound, and because I think. I've said all I could say. What was that? Bars Gump line, I forget, you know, but uh, that's about all I want to say. Um, I think I'm going to stop now and thank you for your attention and hope that it was worth your time. So. It was, man. thank you very much. Okay, uh, I, want to, I want to find out from um, the newspaper uh, editors down in the area, their reaction, but first, uh, Rochelle and then Bobby Bowman had their hands. And Jill, those three had their hands up. Then we'll go to the newspaper. Uh, thank okay, Rochelle, you so much. go ahead. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you so much, Hank, for um, all of the amazing work that you and your students have done. I've gotten to the age now where I can ask this question without feeling like I'm being um, offensive. Who's going to carry on this work? How, how are students uh, looking at this as long-term work or as making sure that this continues. Th this is just vital and powerful and so important. And I so appreciate you bringing it us, to us today. So you've detected that I'm of a certain age. <laughs> oh, I, I am too. <laughs> I, think I, I think I said it. Um, you know, I don't know. I, let me say, remember when I told you I went down to Dawson, I mean, to uh, Aust Austin, with three students and then we were going to the cemetery and I, I'm, I, I'm just meeting these students. I mean, we've been in class four weeks or so at that point. Uh, we only meet once a week, I didn't know them well. So I said to this one student, well, I said to all of them, what are you gonna do when you leave Emory? And one said, I'm gonna become a large animal vet. I'm going to veterinary school and become a large animal vet. Uh, her name was uh, Ellie Stuttered. And I said, really great, you know, she is the one who, Three hours later, finds the gravesite, okay, of Isaiah Nixon. And it changed her life, okay? I didn't change her life. That changed her life because she saw it. And she comes to me about a couple months later, and she wants to know if I'll recommend her for an a internship at the Carter Center here. Um, and I said, sure. I said, send me your essay. And she did. And I reading it at nine o'clock at night in my office here at Emory, you know, thinking, God, why am I still here? This, that, the other. And I saw in her essay, the impact that that moment had on her and it changed her. And she decided she was probably going to go to law school. Wow. Okay? So she could become an FBI agent in civil rights. Okay. So she starts applying to law schools. She goes, to, ends up at Duke law. She, and uh, she's now graduated. She's working for a law firm here at Emory. I hope that she's going to try to make her nut and then she can go do the Lord's work. OK, um, she's just I was just I mean, not that we don't need veterinarians and large animal veterinarians, but I think we need people who think like her doing that kind of work. So a lot of the students come back. They do. You know, I'm tromping through the woods every weekend now, way south Georgia with two students who took the course last year. Okay, so they stay on to, to work on these as long as they can. 
that's not a complete answer to your question, but it's what comes. No, that helps tremendously. And I have one quick follow. Can I get you to do this for an audience in Detroit? Sure. Thank yeah. you. I'll and I'll try to make sure I get the sound fixed. I don't know what happened on that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. All right, Bobby Bowman. Hank, thank you so much. How do we contribute to your efforts and to the efforts of the students? And can you put that in the in the check box so we can send you a check? Uh, yes. Um, I as I when if I'm going to give you a web the website and there is a donate button there. Okay, um, contribute or donate or something, and I think it works. And if it doesn't, you can you know, reach me, but I'll, I'll put a bunch of stuff in here so you can reach it. First of all, thank you. That'd be very generous of you. Uh, a lot of the things that I end up doing, speaking engagements, the money ends up going right back into the project. But I will say Emory, however, has been generous with me. You know, and they've, they've not said no, okay? But I don't ask for much either, so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Geisler. Um, actually, that was just my applause hand that was oh, up, okay. but, but my comment is I'm going to listen to the podcast and continue to tell everyone who has never read uh, this great book, The Race Beat, that it is as timely in this moment and even more so, I think, than when it won the Pulitzer in 2006, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I want to see if, uh, if uh, what the journalism uh in this uh, it, uh, should be, uh, and that's what I wanted to ask uh, Buddy Hughes and uh, Joe Neville's on. They could tell us, uh, as as editors, what do they make of all of this? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is an incredible array of uh, journalism talent here that makes uh, me feel a little <laughs> out of place sometimes. But oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> Before we, uh, before I want to explain a little bit about um, what was going on at the same time as the Arbery thing happened around here, because for as sm small as Brunswick is, there's been a lot of just kind of crazy stuff happen lately. Uh, it's, at the time this was going on, the big thing was there was a car hauler that had tipped over. I don't know if any of y'all saw it on the news uh, in Dar Sound. And they, it took them a year and a half of using big chains and this giant water-bound crane. And um, it's just, and you see it every day, whether you're going over a bridge or something. Uh, so we had that happen. Uh, about eight days after the Arbery shooting, um, indictments came down on the police chief uh, and a few people in the Glynn County Police Department related to a scandal with the special drug unit where a uh, police officer uh, was engaged in activities he shouldn't have been with a confidential informant. Hmm. Uh, so we had that happening. And then in the middle of all this, in, in March, as, uh, as all of us know, uh, the pandemic kind of comes to the area. So it was, we had a lot on our plate. And then at the same time, because of the pandemic and then the impact it had on our page count and our advertising, which just went completely away because there was, we had about eight pages of paper. We usually have a two section paper, three on the weekend. And we just, we, our ads were just gone, just completely gone. There wasn't anything. Um, so we wound up having even, you know, laying off some personnel and it was, uh, it was a tough time. And eventually, I don't want to say eventually, the, the shooting never set right with our main crime reporter, Larry Hobbs. And Larry is also, for context, our history reporter. He's done a lot on um, the, the Gullah Geechee and the history of, um, of uh, the people who were slaves and former slaves and, and uh, just the rich amount of history there is for that around here. And we it took us, I think, around April when we finally got the police report. And I believe we did have to file a, uh, a, a formal um, uh, request for it. Normally, if we ask for something, the police for the most part have been pretty good about giving us a report if, um, you know, within a couple of days, it usually hasn't been a problem. But the fact that it took them so long was one of the things that tipped us off that something with this whole situation wasn't right. 
and then we and then it kind of snowballed from there the the uh, district attorney from um, waycross eventually recused himself and the liberty county or the liberty uh, district attorney took over and he put it before the grand jury and then the gbi came in and the video came out and all of this happened and like it was just bam 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 just like once everything started to crumble really for the uh, those that didn't want these men arrested and then it finally culminated at the you know uh, see it was march 8th or so when uh the arrests or so finally took place in a couple of weeks uh Roddy Bryan was later released uh, was very arrested after the michaels so it was an interesting time both um in trying to get this done trying to uh cover other big things that are happening at the same time and i do you think the biggest tip off for us was the fact that it took us so long to get that police report and we started digging into what happened we got the 911 call a few weeks after we got the police report and the most damning thing there was you could hear the 911 operator asking what he did wrong it's like the it, the 911 operator was like almost flabbergasted that this person was calling this in it seemed like but that was kind of the time frame around it. And it was all just very, just a lot at once. And then it kind of picked up steam. And it was amazing just how quickly uh, this thing went from someone trying to claim self-defense to them actually being charged. And, and I, the thing that has always stood out to me is um, um, uh, Ahmad's mother, told our reporter that she didn't find out from the police. She found out from our story on the report about all this, about the circumstances around it. So it's, it, it's been an incredible just experience the last two years around here, dealing with this unfortunate tragedy that should have never have happened. What about your readers? What are they? What are they? said about all of this we uh we've got a lot of emails about uh that we should look deeper and we got a lot of uh, letters to the editor too and that's another thing that kept us going was you know we 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 did keep digging especially after we got the police report and found out what was going on um it was we heard a lot of feedback from people who um and i'm who we we may not have heard from before. We are a more conservative area, but to put that in perspective, uh, the city of Brunswick, there's two, there's, two, there's two main entities in the county. There's the city of Brunswick, uh, and then you got Glen County, which controls the unincorporated areas, including St. Simon's Island. Um, and the city of Brunswick uh, has elected, you know, has a majority uh, African-American um city council the last two mayors uh we just recently elected a, a new mayor who was black following a, a two-term black mayor so i don't want to say the county is less progressive but it's it's more of a, the you look at its county commission and you see uh six white guys and uh one representative uh who represents brunswick who is black so these dynamics are all in play, but even from people who you wouldn't think would be, who would who would kind of support, you know, oh, follow the police, that's what they said. These guys must be acting in self-defense. Even a lot of those people were like, you guys got to look into this. And we would tell them that we were, and we are. And uh, I got to give a lot of credit to our reporter, uh, Larry Hobbs, who just, he never let it go, even though we were, working under different difficult circumstances all things considered with the, the pandemic and stuff and there are probably a million things i wish i could go back and do differently uh but it, the fact that we were able to help and bring some of this to light is something that something that i am proud of great i think jill had a question for you jill geisler had a question about the video 
Joe. Okay. Oh, just a little more on the backstory of of the um, how that video surfaced. Okay, yeah, the video. Um, this is a, something I'm still hoping to do. We haven't been able to do it yet. I'm hoping to talk to the person who leaked it because we do know who that was. It was an, an attorney in town for Roddy Bryant who leaked the video, and um, I think he was. Honestly, I think they were trying to prove that it was in self -defense. I think they leaked it to try to help the McMichaels and, and Brian. And I don't know anyone who sees that video and thought it would help them. I just, I, to this day, that has not always confused me. But sometime around, I want to say it was, I want to say it was May 2nd or 3rd, 4th, in that range in 2020. Uh, I got a, uh, I got a call at like 8.30 in the morning and it's like there's this video of the shooting's been leaked online and i i looked at it and it's one of the most horrific things i've ever watched and um yeah it was it, we talked in the immediate aftermath to the guy who leaked it and he's he he seemed to think it was it would help uh roddy i think in particular not i don't know if he thought it would help like michaels but i think he he thought it would show that roddy was not involved in the shooting that kind of stuff but are you yeah, I'm, I'm still. You talking about ahead. Mr. Tucker? I'm just curious, buddy. This is Hank. Up. Are you talking oh, about Mr. Yes. Tucker? Yes, Mr. Tucker. Oh yeah. Well, we had one of my students interviewed him at length, uh, and it's on the podcast. Uh, and he did think that it would it was exculpatory, and uh, because he said if you look at closely and you slow it down like I did, you'll see that uh, Ahmad Arbery hit. Travis Mc, uh, McMichael upside the head 12, 15 times. I mean, he saw something that I've looked that I, and I said on the podcast, I've looked, I've looked, I've looked, I don't see what he sees. So he, he apparently did think it would be, you know, exonerating. He later went on to say it was a terrible thing they did and you know, they shouldn't have done it. But, um, and he's the one who gave it to the radio station, I guess, that ultimately mm -hmm. put it on their website. The other thing I'd be curious if y'all are looking into things would be the police officer who went to Mrs. Uh, Arbery's home and told her that her son had died, told her he was involved in a burglary and that he got shot and killed in the, during a burglary. And, I, and that police officer later testified during the trial, but for the prosecution. And apparently that was a real stomach turner for her to have the man who lied to her about the circumstances now jumping to the side of the prosecution to to help them but i just wondered if that police officer's still on the force or if he's being called to account for having misrepresented the truth to mrs arbery i believe he still is the police department has been very um lax to get into specifics mainly because i think they're still facing a lawsuit from um from the family and related to that. And I don't think they want anything to be used against them if they say it. Sure. Uh, but there has been, there's been also, which I should say, a lot of turnover in the police department. As, as I mentioned before, uh, the fact that there was a scandal with the Gwynn County Police Department right as this broke, right as this happened, I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, that matter uh, between the, the chief and his obstruction or the charges he's facing, I think it's a kind of a dereliction of duty type charge. I don't remember the specifics, um, but those are still out. So, and those, and they, it took them a couple of years before the, after the GBNet scandal broke for that to really come to light. There's been a, a tug of war between um, those that kind of want to consolidate the police department and those that want the county and the city and the sheriff uh, to all op to operate separately, and in the end of that, in, in the middle of this fiasco uh, of this big tug of, tug of war, um, this just awful tragedy is kind of dropped in the middle of it. And then we now have a new police chief uh, um, who is a uh, a black man who came in, and he he was as open as he could be about the case. Um, but he's also trying to toe the toe the line to because of the lawsuits that are currently going on. So, but um, and now we've got a discrimination lawsuit filed by a few people that they were the county only sought out to hire a black man didn't 
uh, didn't give uh, Black women uh, and Latinos a chance that was just filed last week. So uh, there's still a lot of flux about this police department and the way the county has handled the situation as a whole. Okay, thank you. Uh, as Jill, uh, Jill Neville's Hahn, uh, what is the view from Savannah? Well, um, Richard, I think um, from Savannah, you know, we're about um, an hour um, from Brunswick, but um, if you look at the history of this case now, I'll, I'll kind of go back to mid-November when I joined the Savannah team um, from, from West Texas. Um, we were in the midst of essentially um, seating a jury, um, but from a historical standpoint in um, this case, it took nearly 10 weeks um, for law enforcement to even make the first arrest. Um, and then if you sort of fast forward to jury selection, um, 11 um, white jurors, one black um, in Glynn County um, where 27% of the population is black in Brunswick. Um, so a lot of um, bumps along the way that gave you um, extreme pause um, in how the case was handled, how it continued to unfold um, more recently with the uh, hate crimes um, um, trial where even um, the, none of the defendants, Travis McMichael, his father, Gregory, their neighbor, um, William um, Bryan, none of them took the stand um, in their own defense. Um, and they only called, the defense lawyers only called one, they rested after calling just a single witness. Um, as you know, it took only four hours of deliberation to find them um, to convict them of, of um, being guilty in the federal hate crimes trial. So when I look at what the phenomenal work that um, Hank and his students, um, just um, Hank has shared with us, the connection that I see between um, those cases um, just sort of shouts to me, um, those individuals, just as um, the individuals in the Maude Aubrey um, case felt as though they were justified in doing what they did. It, it was my right to do this. Um, so what we're looking at now, or we're exploring a little deeper is that sort of um, psyche that exists um, what made them feel as though um, it was their right to hunt Ahmad Aubrey down, to chase him and, and ultimately kill him. Um, so our reporter on, um, who is based in Savannah, Raisa Hambersham, who um, took the lead on coverage along with um, one of our reporters, um, uh, India uh, Yancey in um, you at USA Today collaborated on coverage. Um, our next step is to sort of explore that look at um, what, why does this exist? You know, I think Hank's team showed us um, just in what we've just looked at. Um, there's a, there's just a belief that I'm, it's my, it's my God-given right to do this, but why? Why do you feel that way? Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. And of course, um, the sentencing date um, is to come in the uh, federal hate crimes trial. Um, so in, in looking forward, I think spinning um, the story forward, we're still exploring some of those those angles as well. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Jerry Mitchell, do you have any uh, any thoughts on all this? Uh, 
No, I think it's just excellent work by uh, the students and Hank and, and just great work. And it just shows, I think, demonstrates why um, journalism is so important. And I'm sure everyone would agree with that on the call. It's just, uh, we, we do this because it does indeed change lives for the better. And I think that's uh, an important thing. I think journalism is one of the world's most noble professions in the world. And I think we, we need to remember that. Yeah. Here, here. Okay. Um, people are jumping off. We have room for time for a couple more questions before we, uh, go to our introductions. Uh, anyone else have uh, any questions for our, or our, our, our comments? Uh, this is Beatrice, I do. I've been yes. photographing the Mount Aubrey family for the last two years. It started with, um, uh, with Mother Opal Lee. She was honored in Brunswick about two years ago and I didn't know anything about the case. Apparently it was like uh, two months after he had been murdered. She was invited by the family. So that was my first introduction. And then I've been photographing for the Transformers Justice Coalition. But my question to Hank is, I've gotten to know the family very well. They're very kind of close friends of mine now. Have your students had a chance to interact with the family uh, like your other cases, such as talking with the mom, the father, or anything like that? Uh, no, the timing was such that uh, largely because of COVID, this was the least on the ground of any of the podcasts we did. Okay. And as it was, that's why I didn't do the one that was in Dawson, Georgia. And um, in the summer of uh, between May of 2020 and September of 2020 was when we were working on this. And oh. I did, like I said, I discouraged the students from going down there mm -hmm. and, and myself, though there were people who would have liked us to come down there, but they said, we can't promise your safety. I mean, as far as COVID safety, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's always a, the Zoom option, that kind of thing. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that's right. Well, well, there was family. There's a there's a guy here in town who was very helpful for us, who's uh, a cousin, Jazz Watts, I think, who you may know. But And um, I've gotten to know him well and gotten to know other family members well, but not face-to-face. -face. I got you. And then also, I just want to uh, note that Savannah State University sent some of their students down to the 100 uh, pastor rally. And they're going to have an exhibit at Savannah State University, I think, starting opening up on the 2nd of April. Oh, OK. Just to kind of put that out there. Yeah, OK. One last comment. Um, I spoke to a couple of guys in, in Brunswick. And apparently this, that what happened to Mont Aubrey is part of their culture. They, they told me they were afraid of white men in pickups. If you saw white guys in pickups, you hid, you ran. Another guy told me uh, he had to hide for two hours because he was chased in the same manner. So I guess it's just part of the white, the white racist culture. It just perpetuates itself and it's not that they can get away with it. But I just want to share that comment with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now Bala Batista, I want to ask you a question first. But first I want to hear from Andale Gross, who I did not introduce earlier, uh, who is who has the AP's race and ethnicity team. So I want to ask Andale what he uh, makes of all of this. Hey, thanks, Richard. <clears throat> um, very enlightened. I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. I, I guess I didn't read the notes clear, closely enough to realize Hank was going to be on. You know, the race beat is like mandatory reading, you know, for folks on my team and folks that I mentor. Um, this case is, I mean, Beatrice kind of hit it on the head, you know. I know folks are looking for for answers and what happened here, and it's just, it was just white, it was just white supremacy. I mean, it was, it was, it was racism. These folks felt entitled and empowered to go after someone they felt did not belong, you know, in that in that part of their of their community. And um, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, Donald, former President Donald Trump uh, emboldening people uh, to be more to be more open with this type of attitude, uh, you know, in, in this in this current era. Um, just can't put it all on Trump. Um, it's it's just you know it's it's just embedded in in the culture and in America. And I think it's starting to kind of come become more mainstream. You start to see it more. Sadly, I don't think that what we saw in Ahmaud Arbery um, will, be, will be the last of it. Um, and really, if you just look at our history and connect the dots, I mean, you, you know, it's direct, you know, lineage to what we saw with Emmett Till, you know, what we saw with Trayvon Martin. Um, it's just, 
every now and again, it just kind of reoccurs and we grapple with it. And we, I feel like we continue to try to search for answers, but the answers are kind of right in front of us all along, s sadly. And, you know, racism is um, just something we got to really continue to confront, be honest about it, write openly about it, you know, not be afraid to ask the, the right questions about it um, and, and continue to expose it. And hopefully at some point, it'll become a point where we're at least a little further, you know, along than we, we have been, you know, throughout our history. But now this is a pleasure. Our team is um, national uh, race and ethnicity team uh, for AP. Um, I succeeded the great Sonia Ross, uh, who who was her 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 baby when she was at AP, and I, I got the privilege of being named to the position in 2019, and have um, some great folks on my team like uh, Aaron Morrison, Cat Cat Stafford, Noreen Nasser. We're 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 a, a small team, but we punch above our weight. Uh, we do a lot of great work. Um, we have a lot of folks who contribute in a larger context, but they aren't—they aren't, they aren't full-time race writers. But one of my goals this year is to add some add some folks to the team and just continue to try to do some uh, some work that we feel like is among the most important work that, that we do as uh, as journalists. So thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, is there a way that people can? Uh, well, I guess we use the chat. Yeah, yeah, I can put. I'll put my info. I'll, yeah, I put my info in the chat. And then yeah, anytime like you guys have you know story story thoughts ideals, just want to rap, like just hit me up, you know, and then and we'll if if I can't help uh, get the story written, um, we'll, we there's a lot of ways we get stuff done. It takes a village, but we a lot of ways we can get stuff done uh, at AP. And if my team's not some uh, the team that can work on a particular story. You know, as you know, race intersects in so many different ways that there may be other teams that can do the story. So I'll put that in the chat, though. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Paolo Baptiste, and then we'll go to our introductions. Uh, thank you, Richard, for this uh, fantastic uh, roundtable. And thank you, Hank, for your presentation. I have a question involving uh, research methodology. Um, I proposed uh, a course that not a course, but an assignment that would help would ultimately um, have students to create a collection of oral history uh, reports and memories that would be donated to some archive. Uh, I'm working with, uh, in another situation, I'm working with a colleague who we are to produce, do conduct some oral history uh, research. She wants to use release forms. Um, and that, my experience has been that people close up a little bit. They're a little leery uh, when we're talking about signing essentially a contract. Um, hey, did you use release forms uh, with the people who you interviewed uh, for, for the study with the students? Was that question to me? Yes. Uh, no, we did not. I, I used release forms for the race beat, and I regret it. <laughs> oh, really? Uh -huh. What happened? Why do you regret it? No, it's what happened was we gave uh, all our recordings to a particular archive, the Southern Oral History Program at University of North Carolina. And frankly, they didn't do the job. They never knew they had it. They, they never got it up. So I took it back and uh, it'll be, an, Emory will be announcing soon that it has that in, in the entire race beat files. Um, but in order to get, uh, I have to get everyone, including people who are no longer alive and say to them that form you signed for the University of North Carolina Southern Oral History Program, I now need you to withdraw that and sign one for Emory. It's just a mess, it'll work out, it'll work out. but. Uh, no, generally for journalism type of things, I, I do not get people to sign things. I hear you. Very good. Thank okay, you. we're going to go to our uh, introductions uh, now, so we, everybody will know who who uh, else is here. Now, Bala, we're where? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll we'll go back to you and and please introduce yourself. 
My name is Bala Baptiste. I am professor of mass communications at Miles College and um, a, I would say a former journalist since I'm not practicing collecting newsworthy information and disseminating it, but I am a researcher and a writer. Uh, I have a book called uh, Race and Radio Pioneer and Black Broadcasters in New Orleans, some work on the second one uh, concerning the racial integration of the daily newspapers in New Orleans. So I am interested generally in the intersection of race, mass media, and Black people. All right, thank you. Uh, Roger Weatherspoon. Good afternoon. Thanks again for hosting such an informative um, uh, program. Uh, I've been a journalist for about 60 years in all forms of the media. Um, and um, thanks for being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. you, you stayed <laughs> quite a bit of, of uh, conversation in the chat. So we'll see what that's all about. There were always blacks who fought back. Um, I, I, did, I did a story for D Magazine, a, a special edition on the history of blacks in Dallas, and had a photo when they, when they dedicated the new courthouse in 1910. Um, they, they figured it would not be a complete ceremony if they didn't have a nigger hanging from it. So they erected a scaffold and it had a hang, hanging, and, and they were. You know, 10,000 people lined up smiling under this for um, pictures and, it was, and, a, and a postcard was made from it. And a guy doing a historian, a black historian doing research with me, walked over to me and sat down and said, I've never seen this picture. It's my uncle. Mm. And he told, me, he told me his background. He was a prominent businessman. And um, the sheriff had told him, I want a piece of your business. And he said, take it from me. And so he had a gun strapped on there, had a shootout, and the sheriff lost. And that's why he was um, executed or murdered. Lord have mercy. OK, thank you, Roger. Uh, Carol Mumford. Oh boy, every one of these talks is like um, mind blowing. Thank you. Uh, hey, thank you. Roger, wow, you better write a book. Amazing stuff. Um, Hank, thank you. I loved it. I teach uh, at Central Connecticut State University. I'm also an opinion editor at Hearst Connecticut Media. Um, Hank, wish we could reproduce your teaching. Um, love to see your syllabus. <laughs> what an amazing, what an amazing two hours. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Carolyn. All right, Jerry, we, we know, but, but unless you want to add something about what you're doing, you're doing your, your uh, project. Are you talking to me, Richard? Yeah, do you have anything to add about Oh, uh, the only thing I'd add is just if uh, if people are interested in uh, civil rights history, I each day on Facebook and Twitter, I post it in the chat. Uh, I post um, if you're interested. Some of you already follow me, I know, and but anyway, if you're interested in such, we I do that. And I, I can mention my book too, since I'm <laughs> since I'm plugging. Um, and my book's Race Against Time, which is uh, about uh, some of these civil, uh, four civil rights cold cases that that I investigated and were successfully reopened and reprosecuted in conviction. So, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, and uh, we heard, we heard, we know about you. We know about Beatrice, uh, John Watson. Hi, I'm John Watson. Uh, 20 years as a journalist, 20 years as a professor here at American University uh, teaching journalism and communication law. And, and Hank, I'd like to kidnap you and bring you here and just pump you for all your work because we could use what you do times 10. Thank you very much for today. Um.
Richard, you're fading out. Oh, Get sorry. All right, how about this? You have uh, to as many that. of you know, Journalism has uh, launched a partnership with American University. And so we'll be working with John and his colleagues uh, on some projects. Uh, L.A. Francis. There we go. Yeah, thank you, uh, Richard. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Elliot Francis. Spent uh, 45 years or so as a television radio news anchor, currently uh, host and producer of Now with Elliot Francis, streamed live each week on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And Hank, a wonderful podcast. I'd love to uh, talk with you at some point, to try and get you to come on the uh, the live stream so we could talk about that more and spread more information about a very very important subject i've really uh really enjoyed that and love to hear more so uh if we could do that would be great talk thank, to you, you soon. thank you thank you lawrence aaron first timer yes yes good afternoon i'm lawrence aaron um a former columnist at the bergen record that was my last newsroom um quotes nine to five um although i consider myself still a journalist uh, and um, I uh, have done some teaching, uh, taught a, co a course called Blacks in the Media, uh, which was very well received at Ramapo College, which is where I was. And um, one of the things that I was uh, uh, curious about with my students, who were mostly white, I would say 80% uh, of the class was white. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, sort of turned them on was uh, uh, a book called Soldiers Without Swords, oh, which yeah. was uh, Stan Stanley Nelson's book. Um, so I, I do, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, a film is, is what I meant to say. Yeah, Thank you yeah. for the quick. Thank you yeah. for the editing, uh, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> so I um, look for all opportunities to uh, continue freelancing, but uh, I'm, I'm very much turned on by uh, this presentation that Hank just made. Uh, I've got some material that I can uh, sort of incorporate uh, in my next teaching gig. And I really appreciate, uh, you know, I have a lot of questions. I don't know who to, to pose them to, but one, one of my questions is about the prosecutor who was um, indicted for basically lying in the Ahmad Arbery case. And uh, it, uh, sort of would like to know more about uh, her and, and what her motivation was, if, if anybody has. Uh, Okay, oh, you can right, put okay. that, please put that in the chat. So whoever- uh, I'll be glad to do, that. Yes, we'll do that. Thank you again, Richard. Okay, and thank you, Lawrence. Yeah. Uh, Buddy Hughes, do you have anything more to add briefly? Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you guys for uh, inviting me. Uh, this has been an incredible experience. Hank, I loved your presentation. Uh, and just if anyone in, wants any more information uh, about how we cover things, you can reach out to me or to our reporter, Larry Hobbs. I'll leave the info in the chat and just thank you. I appreciate it being a part of this. Thank you for being here. All right, uh, where's Diana? You just, oh, you moved. Diana Fuentes, unmute please. Unmute. Unmute, unmute. There, sorry, okay. it wasn't letting me, huh? But yes, Panetta got it taken care of. So I'm Diana Fuentes. I've been a journalist more than 35 years. And currently, I am a year's worth into executive director of the Investigative Reporters and Editors. We're a nonprofit organization, have about 5,500 members the world over. And we teach data analysis and investigative reporting. And we're working on our diversity right now. And so this has been an incredible, wonderful, amazing, inspiring, moving, brings tears. Um, Great thing, Richard. Once again, wonderful, wonderful ah, exposure Thank to all sorts of important things. Okay, Jill Neville's on. Anything else you want to add? No, just thank you. Super excited to be here and just to listen, absorb, and and speak a little. So <laughs> thank You're you. Here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mary Curtis, Mary C. Curtis. Hey, great conversation. Again, I might be also reaching out to Hank because I'll be teaching some young people at the New York Times Academy this summer, and it would be good for them to know that young people can make a difference. I'm zooming in from Charlotte, North Carolina, past New York Times and Charlotte Observer, present roll call columnist, host of the Equal Times podcast, senior leader with the Op-Ed Project, and contributor to NPR's uh, 
station, WFAE, particularly they've just uh, in Charlotte uh, inaugurated a race and equity team um, because mm -hmm. there's a lot to be done. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mary. Benita Bing, our uh, producer of the podcast, of the uh, roundtable. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Benita Bing, president of the Exposure Group, African American Photographers Association, located here in Washington, D.C., and also uh, owner of Talbert and Bing Studio, located in the Brooklyn uh, Northeast section of uh, D.C. And uh, the producer in helping out Richard with this uh, Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Benita. Uh, Rochelle Riley. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rochelle Riley. I'm a member of the Board of Journalism, a longtime uh, journalist who left the Detroit Free Press newsroom in 2019 after almost 20 years to become the city of Detroit's director of arts and culture. But I remain a writer by trade, warrior by necessity, so I still... <laughs> <laughs> and I am so honored to be in any space with Jerry Mitchell and Hank. Uh, I mean, this was one of the most powerful conversations that you've had, Richard, and we've had some really good ones. And I want to thank these gentlemen for decades of work covering justice, demanding justice, getting justice. I mean, Jerry has literally changed history with his mm. work. And buy his book. Get his book, please. Um, I'm also the author of two books, The Burden, African-Americans and the Enduring Impact of Slavery and That They Lived, African-Americans Who Changed the World. You can just go to RochelleRiley.com to find out more. But thank you to all the folks I know and to the ones that I've met. This was amazing and necessary. I want everybody in America to hear these stories. Thank you. Well, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. All right. I can't tell who iPhone number two is. That's me. <clears throat> ah, okay. <laughs> Hi, Richard. I'm Gloria Montgomery, <laughs> formerly of WPFW Radio. I am telling you, I am sitting here listening to these presentations and just saying I have so much to learn. Every time I hear you present someone, I am riveted and chilled by some of the details I've learned. I have so much to learn, and I think if I continue to attend these sessions, I will one day come up to speed. Once again, thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for a great job. <laughs> thank you, Gloria. Yeah, we all do have a lot to learn. Uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, I want to thank everybody and particularly those on Facebook who are watching. Um, if you want to uh, uh, get a copy of our, our chat, that people keep mentioning, uh, just, uh, just uh, give me a holler, a shout out on Facebook. Um, and we will, uh, for those who are on the Zoom, uh, we will pr uh, have the, the uh, chat room printed out and everybody will get a copy. So thank you very much. Now, uh, 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 Katia Stitt mentioned uh, that we will have a special round table. Uh, we're, not, we're still working out the details, but it will be a discussion uh, among columnists uh, about uh, Skia Muhammad and uh, not just Skia, but about uh, uh, the whole state of uh, and, and status of uh, black co African-American colonists. And uh, that will be on his birthday, which, which is March 28th. Stay tuned for more detail. It will be broadcast on uh, WPFW, uh, which is WPFWFM.org for those who are, are, are beyond the, the broadcast transmission area. So uh, you'll get more information about that. And I wanna thank everyone else for, for helping to make this a success. And uh, it was uh, thought provoking and I hope it, it uh, changes journalism for the better. So thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see you, see most of you next month, I hope. Uh, so enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank, Thank you. you. Richard. Thank you, Richard. Okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you, Richard. everybody. Thank you, great session. Okay. Oops, That's the week all.